Well, let's start off with James Jachi Kwesin, uh, because we just have a news coming in from the court, and Accra High Court uh, presided over by uh, Justice Mary Azu has ruled that the trial of the NDC's James Jachi Kwesin will be heard on a daily basis starting from July 4, 2023. The court ruled that its June 16 order announcing his arrangement uh, was within the law and a case uh, for review had no uh, basis at all. Let's uh, get details from our legal affairs correspondent, uh, Joseph Akable, who is uh, joining us via Zoom now with uh, details on uh, the latest. Uh, of course, we know that the High Court is making this ruling after uh, having a day to reflect on the uh, arguments that were made by counsel uh, for change such equation and also uh, from the Attorney General side. Why is the judge arriving at this decision? So Justice Yanzu explains that a court has the inherent jurisdiction or the power to review its own decision and again makes the point that as far as the Constitution, the Courts Act and other relevant laws are concerned by way of even decisions that have been, making by, have been made by higher courts such as the Supreme Court, it entrusts the power to the court to regulate its proceedings. She says it is not at the convenience of the parties involved. It's rather at the court's own determination. So a court has the power and the right to decide when to hear a case and does not share this authority with any other individual. And so that is how come the court came to the conclusion that it will exercise its power to determine when to hold proceedings. You recall that the court had, was sitting on the 16th. Before even sitting on the 16th of June, it had already decided that it was going to have a hearing on the 20th and, and, and the 21st. And so by way of the addition that the court made, it was just the 22nd and the 23rd that the court added, subject to the agency's request and indicating that the day-to-day -day basis would take place thereafter. And so the court says that since the 21st and 23rd had already passed by, it means that it has to fix dates going forward. And so in terms of what the arrangements will be going forward, this particular court where the court sits uh, at the criminal court three, it's not available on Mondays due to other courts that utilize that facility as well. And so the court said that it was not going to sit on Monday. In terms of Tuesday, the court again said it is the day that the election is taking place and it has considered that and decided that it's not going to sit on that particular day. But going forward, it will sit on the 29th. On the 30th is Martyrs Day, so it will not sit on that day. So it will come back on the 4th of July. Then after the 4th of July, the court says to exercise its powers to hear the case on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that is the decision that the court has come up with. And both sides seem very satisfied with this decision. The reason being that for Mr. Kwesin's side, they make the point that the substantive concern that they had with a day-to-day -day arrangement was that it meant that if he came on the 23rd of June, it would have meant that he would have had to come the next day and the following day, which means that you don't have ample time to embark on a campaign ahead of the June 27 uh, parliamentary by-election. And so they are satisfied with this arrangement in that the court has considered and allowed them to stay away on the June 27 when the election is taking place. And substantively, they come back on June 29, then a day-to-day -day basis takes off after July 4. And so they are satisfied. The AG side also make the point that uh, the court has agreed with their position substantively that the court has the power to regulate his proceedings. Uh, and, and, and the, the, and, and the other not. time you, you were in court, you had the opportunity to engage uh, James Judge Equation, who says he's unfazed about whatever happens in court. And um, how is he receiving this latest uh, decision? He was not present in court, blessed. You recall on that particular day when the court indicated I was going to deliver its ruling on June 23, the judge did add that. It was going, uh, the request was made about the fact that they wanted James Jachi Kwesin to be excused from proceedings today, that is the, on Friday. And you know that the judge upheld that particular request and granted him the opportunity to miss today's session. And you recall in that brief interaction with me, he told me that he was actually heading to the constituency. And so we understand he's in the constituency and already when the initial decision came in, he was satisfied. And so with this one, it doesn't really change anything by way of the arrangement that he has made by way of his campaign mm -hmm. for between now and June 27. And so he still, he doesn't have to make change his campaign plans. He's still within the constituency and is going to campaign up until uh, at least a day before the June 27 when the election itself will take place. I see. Um, 
So, for now, the Attorney General's position, is there any change to that? Because the argument has been consistent and the fact that they believe that James Jachikwesen should be a candidate for jail. I mean, those are matters that are still before the court. By way of the criminal trial, the AG's first witness is in the box. And we know that that's a position that the Attorney General holds strongly to and will be advancing evidence in support of that. In terms of uh, this particular decision, they are satisfied with it in that they believe that first the application by James Jachikwesen was dismissed. And so they are satisfied with the outcome. There's another point that has come up topically in the last couple of days, Blessed. You recall the case had been made that the AG had made comments which were deemed prejudicial, and those comments, including one that was published on majoronline.com, an interview had done with the Attorney General, were given to the court as evidence to back that and support this particular application for a variation of the court's order for a day-to-day -day hearing. And the court said those statements that were provided to it were not relevant to help it decide this particular matter because what was before it was whether it should exercise its own powers to vary its decision. And the court said that those statements were not uh, relevant to that determination. And so the AG's office, they, are, they like the other side, are satisfied with what has come up from the court. Uh, so going forward, what's likely to happen? The, the, the dates for hearing of this case and when is the next sitting, by the way? So the, the next immediate sitting will be on the June 29 and uh, the state's first witness, uh, Tichi Manson, who is testifying, will be in a box. He's actually being cross-examined by lawyers for James Jachi Question. So after June 29, the next date will be July 4 and after July 4, a day-to-day -day basis. So every day after July 4, the court will be sitting on this uh, particular uh, matter. Of course, last week, um, given the fact that James Achikwese himself was in court, uh, quite a significant representation from the uh, rank and file of the National Democratic Congress, knowing that this is their candidate standing elections in the um, upcoming by-election within the Sin North area. Still representation from this set of people? Not at all, blessed. In fact, in terms of the key individuals who came, mainly the legal team led by Chachuti Kata. At this time around, he was joined by Baba Jamal and also uh, Terry Waja was also present to support the legal team. Then uh, Tony Lita was also present and former Attorney General Marietta Bria Pong also present. Mm -hmm. that, that made it by way of the, the, the individuals that, uh, the, the big names like we, we normally call them, coming in to show their support. We understand the reason being that they are simply on the ground working actively in a same note. Those who had come with the placards the last time across the road from the law court complex were also absent because we understand again the work is on the ground and so the, 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 the campaign is ongoing at a same note. We understand he's trying to cover as much as many areas as he can to make a strong case for his election on Tuesday as the MP for Asin North constituency. Okay then uh, Joseph Akable thanks for uh, giving us that update my colleague um, joining us, uh, of course, uh, here's our legal um, FS correspondent and breaking down the issues concerning James Jachik Kwesin. But let's uh, get to the story that has got everyone in the, in the nation talking uh, and residents there are beginning to be increasingly concerned about what happened uh, within the Ablekuma uh, community within a suburb of Accra uh, yesterday. The, many residents they say they've been left traumatized after they witnessed the killing of a policeman escorting a cash in transit vehicle, uh, they say uh, the successive gunfire by one of the armed robbers in the midst of this busy road has left them terrified for life. The accident uh, is not the uh, first uh, form of attack and following the trend that we've seen over the last couple of days, it will not be the last. Across the country, armed robbers have taken on unsuspecting public, uh, killing them in some cases. We'll bring you some of these attacks shortly. But first, though, Maxwell Agogba, my colleague, has been reporting from the community. He's been touching base uh, with people uh, who's uh, witnessed this Ablekuma fan milk attack. It's a fuel station um, where the Thursday afternoon robbery um, happened. This road is a very busy stretch, but we're told that at a time of the incident, sometime around 1.30, it wasn't busy, so that gave the robbers the opportunity to carry out the dastardly act. Um, we are told, and from the CCTV footage we have seen, um, the robber um, bolted from um, the fuel station using this side of the road because these barricades um, are no longer there. 
cross the road from this section, join the other road, and then use the stretch. We are told that um, they ran away with a motorbike, they sped off on motorbikes, but later abandoned the motorbikes and continued their journey um, in a vehicle. But the fuel station is not working today. All the people who have been pulling up here to buy fuel today are unable to buy the fuel because investigations are still underway. And as you can see, one of the investigators is sitting with one of the workers speaking and interrogating her. We are told the investigations would continue until the perpetrators are arrested. There was no police or military escorts. Okay. At that time, there was none of that. It was just the police, so officer, the police sitting officer sitting at the front. And then what I also realized was it wasn't on something like a bulletproof or a helmet. It was just a uniform, okay. just like that. Okay, so, and then uh, a gun, AK-47. Yes. Okay, so it was not, there was no escorts. Not, and then also, from observation after the incident, you know, when we saw the body lying in the car, we saw, say, uh, even the windows were, was rolled down then. So uh, we wouldn't tell whether it was rolled up and at that point in time, no, it was just a rush. It was just a trick of an eye. So I, I think it's when they were fourth coming and the windows were down. Mm. Uh, so the question is, uh, at what point, um, because they, they use the passenger side. Yeah. And if, if the car, if, if the door was central locked, at what point uh, it was opened? Mm -hmm. so, so, so there are so many questions to that. So after the incident, in fact, he was gone already. He was gone already. Yeah. Well, yeah. you, were, you were part of uh, those who came here, those who rushed here yeah. um, after the incident. Did he die on the spot? He died on the spot. From the point of view, he died on the spot. Okay. And I think they scared everyone around with gunshots. Mm. So they, they gave a warning shots and we, all, we were scared. We you were scared. You're all scared in we this? We were scared. Because if, if you make a move, uh, they, may, they may shoot you. So we we're all watching from distance. We we're all watching from distance, yeah. Residents have been telling us about how one of the robbers uh, stood right here in this median strip and fired indiscriminately. They tell us uh, that was to prepare the ground for his colleagues who were then robbing the cash in transit vehicle at that fuel station. We are told the indiscriminate nature of the firing um, resulted uh, in um, some bullet holes in some of the structures just some meters away from where I'm standing. Um, they tell us that no vehicle could move when that shooting was happening. And after the firing and the rapid gunfire, the robbers bolted on their motorbikes. Police station. So immediately I saw, I saw the artillery in numbers. Yeah. So they entered there. Suddenly I saw one coming. So the one coming, come and stand here. So holding guns, shooting. Go, 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 go. So we, we were, everybody was here selling. We were, everybody was running. So I, I slept in my, how do you call it, my kiosk. So they, they do the, how do you call it, the, the, the operation almost seconds. So almost seconds, then they finish the operation. Mm. So I saw them sitting on motor going to Abrukma Road. Yeah. So this family, family giants, so yeah. I saw them going to Abrukma. Yeah. That, that, that's, the, that's the this, this thing I saw. Okay. I saw him coming from there, coming from, how do you call it, coming from the police station. So I saw him come and stand here. Mm. He was fired, he fired, more fired. He fired, uh, so I saw the bullets finish. That was him, the bullets finish. So he removed another bullet, then he clock again. Mm. Then he fired, gig, 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 seconds, then he go. I saw them, then they come and stand on the motor, then they go. Okay. Yeah, I'm scared. Like, I get money right and I move from this area, I will live here. Residents of Ablikma Fambok have been pointing to some bullet holes um, on some shops and structures here as evidence of the indiscriminate shooting by the armed robbers. Um, a man I've been speaking to here tells me he saw the robbers from a distance and started filming. He says they pointed a gun in his direction. And fired. Yeah, as the incident happened, uh, I just heard a sound. It was a, it was a very loud sound. So I thought it was a fire outbreak at the filling station. So I took my video, uh, my phone, to make a video of what will happen over there. Because since it's an, uh, a filling station, I was afraid there will be an explosion. So the sound keeps coming, and I saw people running. So I decided to make a video of what was happening. So as I stood uh, at the container right at my left side, trying to make a video, the armed robbers then came out. That was when I got to know that it was an armed robbery case. They then saw me that I was trying to make a video of them, and as they saw me, they turned the gun on me and then gave me two shots. And so lucky, being brought by my side, uh, I didn't receive the bullets. The 
bullet went through the container. Mm. Yeah, that was what happened. So I tried taking coverage of them, but I wasn't able to get it because I, as I saw that it was an armed robbery case, and they've also seen me trying to take a video of them. Yeah, so that was what happened. But I was able to go to the police station and make a video of the police guy that was. Uh, you are one of the traditional leaders. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm a, sure you I'm are. A, I'm a suffer chef for Blue Man. Okay. Here. I'm sure you are concerned about what happened yes, here yesterday. Okay. I'm, I'm at my palace where I hear. Mm. See, some, some robbing happy for here. Mm. But since yesterday, I never, I never come here. To I'm, help. I'm, I'm, I'm out to help. I want to help. When I see any, any robbing or anybody where is having gun, mm. I have to make police know. Then we arrest them. Mm. The only thing I want to do with that, in Ale, in Ale, mm. is, yeah. mm. so the only thing I want to help Ghana government, to, uh, police, Ghana police. Mm. I want to. And uh, you, you think you have information that can help the police? I, I want to uh, now. Before me, to, I want to make investigation. Mm. So anywhere they are, I can get them. Mm. I will let police know. Okay. That's the, uh, um, Thank history. you. So you just had one of the traditional leaders um, from Ablekuma here. Um, he's here actually to meet um, the police commander for the area. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's sitting in his vehicle and he tells me that they have a meeting and it's about the shooting, you know, um, that happened. I'm not sure the police commander would want to speak to me, but let's, let's still try. Hello, commander. He's in his vehicle right now meeting. The... Hello, commander. Okay. He says he doesn't want to speak. Well, uh, let's get you some data on some of these incidents that have uh, occurred over the uh, last few days. Uh, we start off from the 5th of January 2023, uh, and this one happened on the Bokwakra Highway, uh, somewhere in the Upper East region, where a cargo vehicle transporting uh, cattle from Boko towards Accra attacked. Uh, they, they were actually attacked by Roberts, and we, we recall that case uh, starting off the year. Uh, but then, subsequently, there were some more cases that uh, occurred. So right from January, then on the 12th of February 2023, uh, there was one in the Volta region, specifically uh, around Abo uh, three suspected armed robbery, uh, armed robbers actually gunned down, uh, were, were actually uh, gunned down by the Ghana Police Service or exchanging uh, fire with uh, the servicemen when they were deployed to the area. Uh, after the 12th of February 2023, uh, then came the incident on the 22nd of March 2023, uh, almost like a, on a monthly basis, with this one happening here in Accra again, Dan Soman. And uh, we know that mobile uh, money merchants uh, was robbed of some 4,950 uh, Ghana cities. Uh, that the robbers posed as uh, military and police personnel uh, to carry out that uh, activity. So that's it for the 22nd of March, 2023. So January, February, March. Still in that month of March, we recorded this a table incident within the Bono East uh, region. A bus driver was shot dead in that process, and uh, the robbery operation uh, was between the table area and a mounting. So there you have it. For the same month of March, we had two incidents recorded. Beyond March as well, uh, we know that somewhere when we're wrapping up the month of March 26, thereabout, there was another incident before the month uh, wrapped up. So that one was the, within the Ashaiman area. Uh, the family was attacked by uh, some robbers at their residence, made away with um, the personal belongings that they had, and inflicted some sort of machete wounds on them. Uh, it was another case that became topical in this country. Uh, so that's just three within the month of March. So January, February, March, we had three cases and some other incidents. Uh, occurred as well, including the latest that we uh, have. But I want to bring in, um, of course, uh, people who are, uh, have been wa watching this space, the experts who are beginning to get concerned about this. Uh, uh, Dr. Adam Bona is a security analyst joining us. Uh, we also have uh, Peter uh, Tovu Lanchini, who's a former super of the Ghana Police Service and also a uh, member of Parliament for Wild West. Thank you, gentlemen, for spending some time with us. Uh, Dr. Bona, let me start off with you, this latest incident. I record the former IGP uh, Mr. Kudalo and proposed that idea uh, of uh, trying to uh, have bullion vans that will, will be will be sort of in the form of an armored vehicle. It became topical. I mean, the controversy around it that some of the institutions dealing in cash did not have that kind of money to purchase these vehicles. But it's becoming evident that something of that sort, in terms of an intervention, will be very much necessary. You agree? 
Oh yes, uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to your viewers. Uh, condolences to the bereaved family and condolences to every police officer who is out there trying to protect lives and properties. And also to correct you, uh, that particular directive was mm. given by the former uh, IGP, uh, IGP Opombuen, oh, when okay. the Adedenko right. Right. incident yes. happened. Mm. So, oh, good law, yes. Uh, Kuda law left long, long ago. Okay. Kuda law mm. came, and then uh, Asantia Pier two before. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, in that in that order. So it's yes. rather uh, IGP or the former IGP. He gave that particular directive. Also, to for you know what we I have portioned that we need to be a bit circumspect mm -hmm. when we are dealing with armored plated uh, trucks or vehicles. These are war materials. And war materials such as bullion bands, some of the bullion bands, uh, you need a regulation. You need a law to regulate them. But as we speak, I want to believe that the reason why probably the, that particular directive uh, has not been adhered to strictly had to do with the fact that as we speak, I am not aware if the, the law or the, even the, the draft law has gone to parliament and is been passed. Because the truth is that if you have an open door policy where everyone brings an armored plated vehicle in the name of uh, CIT or cash and trans transit, what do you call it, uh, operations, one day these bullion vans can be changed into war or weapons to destabilize this country. You need to know where you are storing them. You need to know who is importing it. You need to, you need to have a law. So that when people who are supposed to be using them, people who are supposed to be importing them, go against the law, the law pres would prescribe, uh, you know, punishment, and the law must prescribe how these things are brought in. At the moment, we don't have it. And so when these things happen, usually what you see is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, let's do this, let's do this, without looking at the long-term implications of some of these things. And so mine is that they are important. But it's also important to note that bringing them without a regulation or a law, regulating how they are brought in and, you know, uh, if you break the law, how you are punished, could be detrimental to us as a people. And so mine is that let's, that is one lot of what you call it, a conversation. I have also picked intel that starting today, the, you know, the, the, what the number of bulletin vans we have that are registered and supposed to be used as CITs, mm -hmm. the armored plated ones, are going to be the only ones that would move cash and they, they, there won't be any police officer uh, sitting in any soft pickup or soft vehicle if it is not armored plated. Yeah, we have quite a number in the system, but not as we are expecting. So I think that starting this morning, that I'm sure I'm told that directive from Intel, you know, has gone to the Bank of Ghana and they've disseminated it to the, you know, commercial banks who are supposed to move cash. The other thing is that if you look at the video out there, it looks like a lot of things don't add up. And I'm happy your colleague, Mansour Baba went to the scene, spoke to uh, an eyewitness who said that who opened the side of the window, the, the glass was open, uh, the, the door was open. Uh, was it deliberate? What happened? Uh, at what, they, what were they there for? Uh, was it some targeted shooting or killing? Uh, apart from the four or so people who were captured by the CCTV and seen by, by eyewitnesses, were there other people who came up with this idea of robbing and killing the unfortunate police officer? These are things that I am expecting the police hierarchy. They have already started investigating it, but I am expecting that the scope of investigations would be widened because then, you know, uh, this particular type of robbery is I would say anyone from a security point of view will tell you it's alien to what we know, our type of robbery. So usually, if police investigators are going to be very sincere, they will tell you, or investigators, or security personnel who are involved in this will be sincere. They will, by the time they bring a closure to a case like this, you usually would notice there is a foreign influence in this type of robbery. So I am bringing up widening it and saying that I believe the police with the, you know, they have some of the best investigators. They have what it takes. 
they, I understand they've already arrested some people uh, who they are interrogating, some, you know, credible sources. And so they have what it takes for us to be able to unearth how did this happen? Because this looks too easy a robbery. I mean, when you look at it, this looks too easy a robbery. I mean, uh, broad daylight, they are not, they, they are not, they know about a private, nothing, they get there, and they easily, they run before the, 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 the guy who shot, the, the lethal bullet went to that side, the driver had already run out of the vehicle. I'm not by this preempting anything, but I'm only trying to say, it looks too easy a robbery. Uh, you know, a class one pupil who wants to undertake this robbery with a deadly AK-47 can do that. I'm a sure type of robbery, but you can see that uh, they did it believing that they could get away with their booty. And they, unfortunately, a police officer has died. But we all know that in the last two years or so, the police administration has done very well significantly in reducing violent crimes in this country. And so mine is that these incidents, once in a while, uh, we are likely to see it. But the truth is, it is only when they are able to crack them and open them for us to know who did it, that sometimes uh, the criminals themselves who are likely to uh, commit some of these crimes will, will do that. But I will say that uh, the state must put in a lot of resources into policing. I have asked, how many bulletproof or ballistic vests do we have for police officers in this country? Do we have one-to-one -one ballistic helmets? Do we have one-to-one? -one? These are things we must know. And so usually when these things happen, yes, we want to hold the police responsible. We will, but we must as well hold the state responsible. Because if we are not putting, uh, you know, uh, our best foot forward, and all we are doing is maybe, for all you know, I don't know, I don't want to, I have some information, but uh, they, they, the number of black proof that they have might not be the number that we should be. Police is almost nearing 50,000. Do we have 50,000 bulletproof vests? The bank in probably my hometown in the south, uh, if there's a police officer there, there, is the police administration able to give him a vest? Is the finance minister is giving them money to procure these things to be able to make sure that this needless killing of police officers who are out there, young people who are out there to protect lives and property, where we can bring it to a stop? For me, I think that it's a sad day for everybody who is in security, it's a sad day for uh, every police officer. But the truth is that I do believe that these are mm. professionals. Once in a while, these things of this nature will take place. Right. But that is not to say okay. the police administration. Uh, in the last two years, if you ask me, I will tell you that we got to a point where things were actually getting out of hand. I, I get that. I get that. Let when me... probably certain things were. Done. Okay. This is this is why I want to bring in Jones Opokuari, who's also joining the conversation. is a criminologist, uh, and Jones, you've been looking at the mode um, of this attack by the um, robbers. Uh, they went in straight. In fact, if we can have the, the visuals on the screen, you, you see the individuals going in straight um, for the policeman who was in the vehicle. Uh, what does the sign say about this? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Blessed, and uh, a very good afternoon to you and also to, to your viewers. And let me add my voice to what my, my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Bonat, said. Um, I just want to wish the family of the, of the police officer and also the Ghana police my deepest condolences. But I mean, if you look at the signs of, of the robbery, in fact, I've been analyzing this video throughout the, the night, and definitely it tells me that this is clearly an inside job. And I've already made this statement over the period that. Um, most robberies, I mean, of this nature, if you look at previous, I mean, evidence over the period, if you look at a lot of evidence that we've analyzed over the period, most robbery cases of this nature are actually inside job. About 90% about of them are always inside job. So if you look at the way it was carried out within such a short period of time, you could see that this was something that somebody had told them that, look, this is how the operations are done. If you come within this period mm. and you strike, you'll be successful within a short period of time. Right. Look, I have been, I've been in Accra, been to the scene today, and look, I've been asking people a lot of things within the area, and they tell me that this is a place that this bullion van has been coming to pick money for some time now. So the, the, it tells me something. It's somebody within the area, somebody within the vicinity, probably somebody even working within that company, the oil company there, 
or the petrol filling station there who, who has some links to these criminals and probably are giving them information about what happens in terms of movement of money. And mm -hmm. the fact that most of the time the bullion, the bullion van that comes around is not really, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, protected. Yeah. So it is what you can actually see based on the, on the analysis of the video that this is something coming from within. And beyond that, you, you see the kind of uh, vehicle, okay, they were using motorbikes to carry out such an operation that could land them in jail. Why the choice of a motorbike, by the way? Well, they are using motorbike because, you see, most of the configuration of our roads, you know, and our exit routes are, are, are very busy these days. So you see, when you look at, I mean, when I, I came to the area, I could see that that is a very busy stretch where there is a lot of traffic. So one easy way for them to get out of the crime scene within a period of time is to use the motorbike because with the motorbikes, it, they can be able to meander through the heavy traffic and get away from the crime scene even before the police officers came there. And I, if you look at some of the information I have, there were some police officers who, who seemed to be around the area, but they said that where they were facing, they, need to, they needed to go around and go and turn and come back to the scene when they, because they were in a vehicle. So it should tell you that the people might have studied the configuration of the area in terms of, of the Access. movement of flow of traffic and use motorbikes as a preferred means because that is what will help them to get away from the crime scene. And you can see a pattern. Because over the period, if you look at most of the street robberies that we've had from 2021, 2022 to now, mm -hmm. the preferred means of transport for right. these criminals are basically motorbikes because it's an easy way for them to get out of the crime scene before the police get there. Uh, so, so are you saying that this very area we're seeing on the screens now, uh, in terms of access, it will be difficult technically for any security person to have intervened at the time the robbery incident was, was taking place? Well, they could have intervened. I mean, if they were very close, but it depends on, on where they were positioned. Okay, so if you look at the street, I mean, I, I no, said that. And, I'm, and I'm asking the question based on what you are telling us now, that the, the where, yes. as you are learning, this, this is unverified information, yes. but as you, you have gathered, yes. as you're telling us, the where yes. some police yes. men around. Yes, they said they, said they were in a, in a vehicle. When they were, when they were called, they said they needed to go and meander before they come because of where they were positioned, okay? Yeah. So I'm just saying that because of the configuration of the area, mm -hmm. it makes it very difficult for you to use, for instance, a car when you have to meander your way through. Mm -hmm. But motorbikes are key because motorbikes can go through heavy and take traffic situations. And once you are able to meander your way, you can easily mm -hmm. get away from crime scene. So, and it is not only this place. I mean, if you look at most of the street robberies that we've seen over the period, that is the preferred means of transport for the criminals. They, are, they, they prefer that because it is an easy getaway, you know, means of transport for the crime scene. And it is not, you, are, you cannot do what we call a hot chase with a car in very thick area. Okay, so it's very important. That is why I'm very happy that the, uh, the IDP is coming out with this motorbike, you know, on the streets. We, you know, I mean, most of the time you see a lot of police people on the streets on motorbikes. I would have wished that whoever was there, if there were some security people, as I was told, probably within that area, I would have wished those people were using motorbikes. And if they were using motorbikes, probably they could have chased these criminals along the street. But once they were in a vehicle, from what I was told, and, and they were a little bit far from the scene, it would be very difficult for them to meander their way to the crime scene. Mm. Uh, quite a tragic event there. But let's look at policy and how we can reform. Uh, Dr. Bonadi, is you about motorbikes and um, th th this concern and conversation has come up uh, some cities have completely done away with the use of motorbikes and um, especially for i mean commercial or even private reasons what, how, what do we do at this point so knowing that there's a risk involved uh, looking at our traffic the nature of traffic here in accra well it's difficult i mean to add to what my colleague on the other side said it's difficult uh, to do this type of robbery, you know, in, in a vehicle. So since time, even in sometimes in the advanced, you know, countries, sometimes some of these robberies are done uh, and the getaway means it could be a bike where you can easily uh, get away. And so it's a preferred means to, you know, as you said. I, what I must say is that apart from trying to look at the policy of, you know, motorbikes in the country. The truth is that you can't stop. Uh, it's, it's, it's a preferred means of transportation. So you can't say people shouldn't ride. But what we need to do is to be able to identify all riders 
and be able to search them. I think over the period, the police visibility, they are in most major intersections. I'm not sure about that area, but they are in most major intersections. And what they do is to observe their side arms and they are able to go in. I don't know whether they were in that area, but from what my colleague is saying, the officers were not very close. The other thing too is that uh, the risks involved in shooting uh, innocent people and killing them in broad daylight. Because you can see people, once they had the gun shot, people actually started decking, but, uh, you know, if they get there and they would enter into a shootout with them, usually officers would be trained not to engage in a, in a populated area like that. And so they would have attempted to chase them and maybe attempted to gun some of them down. But if you get into a situation like that, would you want to shoot and miss and kill an innocent person no. And so we need to look at that. The other thing is that illicit firearms. I serve on the board of the Small Arms Commission on, on behalf of CSU. And the truth is that we have a draft law, a draft deal that is going through the process. What I will say is that there are too many illicit firearms in the hands of, you know, people. Too many illicit. I mean, and some of them are dangerous submachine guns and machine guns in the hands of people until such a time that we are able to get this uh, draft deal, trying to regulate the acquisition and ownership and training of you know, those who want to acquire firearms, those who want to import them in bulk and all that. We are going to be recycling this information. And I'm actually coming out of an ECOWAS uh, meeting in one of their way. I mean, the ECOWAS group, they are here, and we, we've just gone through a three-day workshop on small arms and whatever, and one of the reasons they are here is to help and see how we can get the deal that we have done, we put together, and is supposed to be passed into law, how we can get it passed into law. Until we do some of these things, it is going to be difficult because every Tom, Dick, and Harry is carrying a weapon. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and some of these people are criminals. Some of these people are amateur. The truth is that everybody is attempting to register a weapon. Sometimes people die and we are not able to follow up and retrieve these dead people's weapons. And the weapons end up in the wrong hands. And so, but the law, the draft law we have, by which has been put together by the small arms and light weapons together with CSOs and other government agencies, together with the German government, European government, and all these people, if this is passed into law, bless it, I am telling you that, I am sure in the next 10 years, this issue about illicit firearms and gun trading and all that, would be brought to the barest minimum. Because every now and then, someone wants to own a gun. And we don't know what happens when some of them even apply them legally. Sometimes they lose them and they never go to report. And maybe we are not able to follow up. So okay. whilst looking at motorbikes and policy and other things, I would want us to also look at, speak about the draft deal that would uh, enforce, you know, uh, some of these things. There are laws to, to do this. But the laws are in pocket. And, mm -hmm. and it's not so stringent. So it's difficult to say we will do it. All Unfortunately, right. maybe uh, I serve on the board, and so I'm able to speak to these things and say, I would urge government, I would urge government and the powers that be to look at this deal, which is still in the deal, it's a draft form, and put it through so that we will, the needless acquisition and the needless mm -hmm. use of firearms, illicit firearms, and killing police officers and sometimes Galancé and doing all manner of things will be regulated and probably we can strengthen the structure and the regime of gun ownership and gun usage in this country. Okay, I want to wrap up with uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Um Let's look at the possibility here in terms of what the police may be on the lookout for in unraveling those who carried out this very attack. What are some, well, of, the, I what, think... what are some of the likely give, I mean, giveaways, leads that will help the uh, police to crack this case? Well, I'm of the view that, I mean, the police should quickly move in, and I'm, I'm, I'm told, in fact, because when I went to the scene, I, I saw certain activity that suggests to me that there were some undercover police people there trying to listen in and, and also gather some information, which is good, but there are people within, within the setup, the institution where the activity took place, that needs to be questioned properly, and also even the driver. I don't know whether um, the driver has as yet reported you know himself to the police or reported the incident to the police he, he needs to be he needs to be talked to as well i mean apart from that I, my, my colleague has said that we need a lot of policy we need a lot of review 
on how the police is supposed to carry out their operation when it comes to the movement of cars. And I've said this over the period. Um, when um, 2002, 2021, a lot of issues of this bank robbery started, I made a point that we have to review this process where we make police people sit in front of bullion fans. Because if you look at the video, you could see that the police had, I mean, virtually no, no time to even respond, even though he was, he was armed. And, and that, is, that is very dangerous. So why can't we have a situation whereby, for instance, these cars can be followed with some unmarked car or with police in, in, in multis, you know, where they can follow this so that when the, the attack comes on the bullion van, the police have a lot of time to respond and to engage the criminals. If we continue to do this, look, we must learn. We must get into the psychology of these criminals and understand how they operate so that we can devise certain, you know, strategies that we can face them. If we don't learn from mistakes and from the experiences of the past and we keep on doing the same thing, First, we are not going to get any results because we cannot do the same thing and expect different results. For me, that is a suggestion I'm, 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 I'm just giving the police. We need to revise the way we let police people sit in front of bullion vans. I mean, these are not even bullion vans. These are, these, are, these are cars that are basically, you know, rickety cars that, that, that have been discarded and that, that is used now. And I think that it is not fair even to, to the security personnel. It is not even fair to their families. And the police will have to look at look Yeah, at but, but my question earlier about the leads uh, that could help the police unravel this case faster. Yes, as I said, we need to. We, they need to talk to the driver. For me, it is very key. They need to talk to the people within, within, within the vicinity. Okay, and also people working within, within the, within the, within the institution. I mean, the, the, the filling station. Because I've already said that a lot of these crimes are basically inside jobs. So, is there someone within who is giving some information? to some of these people. Are some of the people working there probably connected to some of these criminals? It is very important we start investigation from them, and then we can get to the driver, and then we can be able All to right. get some. Uh, OK, I, I wish we have much time to discuss this, but I'm grateful to Dr. Jones uh, Pokuari and also to Dr. Adam Bona for joining this conversation. Uh, this week as well, we, we're keeping our eyes on the flats because uh, that incident has devastated community so in part of the country, killing five persons in just 24 hours of rain. This afternoon, uh, there are fears of a possible destruction of property and loss of lives following uh, the impact of the rains in the Ashanti region, uh, as many as four persons died with one uh, in the western region. Several communities were cut off with uh, even some major roads here in Accra completely submerged. Maxwell Agbagba was at the, uh, one of the places near Kasoa in the central region and reports that residents are quite uh, disturbed about the situation. Sounds of gushing water at the cutoff point here at Abamfu. This is the main road that connects Peace Town uh, to the capital and other adjoining uh, communities. But these men who you see here did not go to work today. Some of them who are taxi drivers here in this community are unable to cross to the other side. Behind me is a stream that overflowed in banks and displaced many from their homes. Many of the residents here have been forced out of their homes by the flood water. The brave ones were compelled to move door to door, rescuing persons who were trapped. I've met Joseph Kwame Nyako. He helped to rescue some of the affected persons. He says, but for their timely intervention, 10 children would have died in the flood. I was inside and I saw people shouting, screaming, and say, oh, let me come out. Even me, I wanted to go and buy something. And I was OK. I saw them screaming, and I said, oh, wow. Then I, I went there to help them. And I saw people going, coming up from their houses, and they want to rescue people. So we gathered boys and also help them to rescue some of the kids, like 10 kids. And okay. uh, doing that rescuing, and we saw a certain woman and a two, two kids uh, drowning, like coming, com coming from, uh, they, are, they are in the water coming. So today I heard, I heard that they, they were rescued at this place. Mm. So I say, okay, then fine. But people were calling me, how, how was it, how was it? I was thinking maybe the, the, the water, send them away but today i had that had that uh, yeah, they are fine so hundreds of residents are not willing to risk it through this flat water 
Many of them who have no choice are compelled to wade through it. I've been speaking to a man who had to carry his sick son behind him to the hospital. He says the road to his residence is impassable and he couldn't wait for the water to subside before taking his son to the hospital. Okay, this is your child? My child. He's sick? He's sick. Okay, so t t tell us a bit about that. Uh, because I really know, this morning before you are going, he had to be full of, mm. before I carry go. I go there say, body no feel well. Mm. When the check comes, so my son is sick, so that's why I go to him. Okay, but mm. well, you didn't get any car to get him to cross? No, 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 no car. Mm. No, no car. So that's why you had to yeah, carry okay. him on carry your back? Him okay. Mm. All the taxi drivers in this community who ply this route to Peace Town and its adjoining communities are idle today. There's no work to be done. I've been speaking to Seth Obain, who is one of them. He's frustrated about the situation. Yeah, yeah but uh, this is where we live for some time now. But yesterday, what happened was terrible, you know, and we couldn't even to cross the river safe is not easy for us. Yesterday around 9 p.m. it was terrible. People were coming from work and they couldn't have problem like yesterday. So we want our MP to come to the area and to come and visit us. Since this problem happened, we haven't seen the MP around, especially the M uh, 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 MC. Even if we don't know him, he have to come and I mean uh, 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 take care of the situation so that we know that we have uh, uh, elders somewhere. But there's nothing of sort going on. So please, we are pleading to the authority to come and visit us to solve the problem. Many of the residents here believe the flooding here persists because of the inaction of city authorities. They are threatening to boycott the 2024 elections. I've been speaking to one of them, Azumi Mahama. She says, look at how we have been displaced by the flood. When elections are getting closer, you see politicians trooping here. They should never step here in search of votes. Our children are not able to cross the school. If you are not strong, the water will sweep you away. Our MP does not do anything for us. He shouldn't step in, an angry Azumi Mahama said, with tears in her eyes. Well, there's a lot happening in the Ashanti region where my colleague Erastus Zarendon witnessed the retrieval of the victims from the uh, OAB stream. Scores of people gather on the fringes of the Atafwa Bridge, which is under construction. They are watching divers who are on a frantic search for the body of Kwame Asuman, 57, who is believed to have drowned today. He is reported to have jumped into the Owabi stream, trying to look for his junior brother, Kwekwa Abwaje, 47, who drowned trying to ride through the floods with a bicycle on Wednesday evening. We were told that this part was deep, but he took the other turn to get to the other side. All we heard was he calling for help. We assumed he had found his junior brother. I later realized he was drowning, and I could not swim. People wail as his body is retrieved from the stream. Now, two people have drowned here at Atafwa Bridge. This is the Owabi stream, and it's a flat-prone area. When it rains, the whole place flats, and so Vehicles moving to Barakese and its environs cannot use this end. So in all, two brothers, all in the same family, have drowned here at Atafwa Junction. Yao Asamoah is a relative of the two victims. <laughs> I may look normal, but I'm hurt. I would appeal to residents here. We have called on the MP to construct the bridge. Yet, people dump refuse in the river, and this is setting the work done back. I would appeal to all to desist from the act. This will create a chance for the river to flow easily. This won't cause floods again.
ensuo to bia e betumi akose ko basa minjin di se a hache betumi afla de bia this brings to fall the number of persons who have drowned between Wednesday and Thursday. Frank Dodu is Regional Nadmo boss. The first one did happen at Tafu, uh, which the person is young, still on course to get the data because we are not able to reach out to the family. So we are yet to have the full details of the one, which presumably is under 10 years old. And we have that also right where we are, Tafwa, which did happen yesterday. And this morning, when the rescue team, that's the fire service, Nadmo, and other people helping to rescue, we, we, we got to know that a brother also decided that he would fall his, his way into the river, and he also got drowned. He wants people to take precaution as the rains come down. But all these things could have been avoided. If you look at the releases and dedications that have been going on for the past four months, there are things that could have been avoided. Our focus is on prevention. That is why we took time over three months. We did education at various churches, marketplaces, media houses, issued a publication that the rains that we are expecting are so much. So we should do our maximum best that once we see the rains coming, we find a safe heavens or a better place to be. Once it's capsized down, then those living in the streams and those that are using bridges and the rest, that is when you can make way once they come down. So in all these cases, it could have been avoided. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko Kumasi. The National Disaster Management Organization says uh, it is uh, working assiduously to, of course, inform the public and also check out some of the at danger zones. We'll be speaking to George AC, who's the Director of Communications shortly, but uh, first, how's the weather outlook like uh, in the next few days, particularly for those in the Greater Accra region? Felicity Ayanfianyo is the head uh, of Central Analysis and Forecasting at GMET. Thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, not a very favourable day um, in terms of the kinds of rains and showers that we've been experiencing over the last 48 hours. Are we able to explain um, why this is happening and how the next few days will be looking like. And, and kindly unmute for me so I, I can give the points you're, you're sharing with us. Uh, Felicity, if you, if, you, if, you, if you don't mind taking off the EFP, so at least you can share the points with us uh, and then we could get you loud and clear. Uh, on some of the pointers you're raising, because uh, for GMET, you have been carrying out uh, surveillance on what's likely to happen uh, and the forecast that, that you have for the next uh, few hours and the days to come. What, what is that telling us, really? We'll definitely uh, reconnect with Felicity Ahimfanyu, who's uh, at the Ghana Meteo Agency. Uh, but first, though, um, the National Disaster Management Organization is also one of the key uh, institutions that uh, is mandated to, uh, of course, deal with some of these uh, disaster uh, incidents uh, that we're, we're hearing of. Um, George AC is uh, with NADMO. Before we get to George, uh, let, let's hear from Felicity yeah. one more time. Felicity, can you hear me? Felicity, I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, we're having some challenge there, obviously, connecting with Felicity. Uh, if George AC is with us, uh, George, the concern of NATMO and what you plan to do in the, in the coming days, knowing that this is a perennial problem, we need to admit that, first of all. Uh, so what we can do, at least in the meantime, while we work out a long-term solution, is for your um, agency to be proactive. What measures are you putting in place to tackle that? Uh, so we'll, we'll still be getting you, uh, of course, uh, those who are responsible for dealing with the disasters that we're uh, recording. Uh, but then we also do know that uh, in the next few days, there's a prediction on uh, or forecast, I should say, on how the weather should be looking like uh, for you in the coming days. So I would see if that will be favorable to you out there. So you stay safe while you drive and commute uh, about. Uh, but in the last few 
day. So we've seen showers all throughout the day. Uh, I think today's the only day within the week, at least giving some uh, chance for sunlight. And uh, that's raising a lot of concerns uh, as to what may happen in the coming uh, days. But we'll get some responses for you uh, shortly, uh, plus get you some uh, explanation uh, as to what may happen in the next few days. You're watching The Pulse. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. How is the weather looking like in the next uh, few hours and also in the coming days? Uh, Felicity is joining us back on Zoom. Thank you uh, for spending some time with us. I was just asking about what we're likely to expect, knowing uh, what has happened over the last few days in terms of the kinds of showers that we've been experiencing. Felicity, are you still with us? Okay. Um, it appears um, we're having some challenge there and we'll definitely uh, reconnect uh, and get you some uh, updates as and when uh, we have that. Now to security, the chief priest uh, of the Teshi traditional area, uh, Numo Badu or, uh, or, or Dami the, sec the first is uh, calling on the police service and the Ministry of Chief Singh and uh, Religious affairs to call a faction of the Teshi chieftaincy uh, affairs to order after um, and to in order to avoid what they describe as a possible uh, communal clash in the community. According to the chief priest, that tra traditions mandate uh, him to perform uh, rituals for the celebration of their annual annual Homo War festival. But a rival faction have also started performing those same rites. We have. Uh, an interaction uh, with uh, the chief priest and my colleague uh, who has been trying to find out what exactly is happening within the community. I have Nyeme ekume ke amenu shishi. Na meka amenu shishi ne lelen dromo na meke ameye na yo saniye. Ameke te court ni ji high court. Ke je high court e wa gbe na e appeal court olu enu ni. In fact, um we've been accused wrongly. We've been accused of fomenting trouble in and around Teshin. But what we want to do today is we want to set the record straight that we are not the people fomenting trouble. Numo Badu Oda no Odia Pense the first, as I'm seated here. I, I was installed in 2019. When I was installed, some of the brethren, some of the relatives were not happy. So they took their matter to high court for adjudication. In fact, the high court handled the case. It went as further as the appeals court. And on 15th of December 2022, I was pronounced victorious. I was accepted as the substantive Osabu Aiku Lomo, um, succeeding Numo Aje Kwanko the first, who passed on in 2019. Um, since then, as a Wulomo or a spiritual leader, we have a way of preparing our Homo War activities. So as the leader of that, I have tried to prepare my calendar. So I prepared the calendar. I copied the police. And every necessary people needed to be informed about my calendar. As you can see, before you leave, I'll give you a copy. I informed everybody. And then I started my traditions on the 17th of May. Only for me to be told that on the 28th of May, and other people are going to perform the very ritual I have performed already. And I am the substantive overlord to do that. In fact, let me show you this document. That is the judgment from the appeals court, of which the judgment is saying that basically, if my people are not happy with my installation, they can go to the appropriate quarters to seek for redress. But till then, I should hold up and manage all the affairs of Teshin 
in end, its entirety. So this is the judgment. I have prepared my calendar for 2023 annual Homo War Festival only for me to see this thing flying. The title is Republic of Ghana, Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs. Please, the people in the ministry doesn't prepare the calendar for the people of Teshin. It is only the Wulomo, and it's the Man Wulomo, the substantive Osabu Aiku Wulomo, who prepares the calendar, and the, it's even preparation of the calendar is sacred for it to be prepared. And everything they've put here contradicts what I have prepared. Well, the other faction led by the family head uh, of uh, the other side uh, has been uh, disputing this. According to them, they are the rightful occupants of the Wulomo store. The reason why all this thing was going, all this thing is going on, was that uh, uh, our former Wulomo, the late Wulomo, passed on. Since w when he was at his lifetime, there were one who has occupied the shrine. He was a servant to the late Wulom. And in touching in our custom and tradition, if a Wulom is installed, they give him a servant who will serve him throughout his lifetime. And it's called Labia. So this labia is there to serve the Wulomo. And in our custom and tradition, the moment the Wulomo pass on, the labia term of office come to an end because it rotates. And we are having three seats in Chiewe where the Wulomo rotates. First, we have Ni Aje, Numo Aje Sankuma. Then we have not, uh, 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 Numo Aje Onankan. Then we have Numo Aje Kwanku. These are the three, three seats that rotate in Chewi. So, the uh, labia or the one who was occupying the shrine, he was a labia or the servant to the late Wulomo. So the moment the Wulomo dies, his turn of office to end automatically. That is our custom and tradition. And the Teshi uh, Council of Elders are asking for the aggrieved parties to resort to the right quarters to get their issues addressed. Ni Noti uh, Tuakwa the second speaks for them. It's been done already by Numo Ulomo on the 21st of May. According to Numo uh, Ulomo, Badu Oda no dear pension, a calendar, his calendar, 21st was that ritual which we call Blaiju. The second one will be Ableku. Once uh, Numo Badu Odia Pense has done the Blaiju, we did not expect anybody to go and do another one in a different house. And those who decided to do the second Blaiju on the 28th had a ruling against them from the appeal court that until they are able to challenge Numo Badu Odia Apense at a traditional court like their regional house of chiefs, they should allow Numo Badu Odia Apense to do his job as the substantive Romo of Teshi. And that ruling is there. We can give you a copy. And how prepared are we as a country for an emergency? Uh, or an emergence actually of uh, a pandemic. Well, COVID-19, Ebola and other outbreaks uh, have taught us that we have never been ready. In this uh, recent past, of course, there's been a campaign by uh, the development NGOs in Ghana to get uh, government to dedicate some funds for such uh, preparations. This month, they held a forum at the University of uh, Health and Allied Sciences. You has in the Volta region to get a uh, 
academia to be on board uh, this initiative. Uh, the forum concluded uh, with this key message, and uh, here are some of them. Uh, the, uh, first of all, there's a need for establishing a uh, dedicated public health emergency fund, uh, which is crucial for addressing gaps in preparedness and response to public health emergencies. The proposed uh, fund initially uh, will be to support will be supported uh, by the 1% COVID-19 levy, uh, which will be renamed as emergency levy and uh, COFIS, uh, actually uh, offers the opportunity for capacity building research, vaccine production and surveillance. That, that was the key message uh, after the uh, engagements uh, that were done. Well, uh, there's a need for us to get some more on this. Uh, so let's bring in uh, those who've been working on this project. Um, of course, working together with the uh, group that we're talking uh, about uh, here, that's uh, Sen Ghana, who've been working on this. Uh, we're joined now by some of those who've been uh, at that meeting, engaging and making these proposals. I uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, first of all, let's know you and what was your impression after the engagements over over the last few days? So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Paul Amuna, Professor Paul Amuna. I'm the Dean of the Binka School of Public Health at UHAS. And uh, UHAS actually partnered our civil society uh, uh, friends from the Global Health uh, um, um, uh, uh, advocacy incubator and send Ghana in order to actually, you know, add a voice to the the call for uh, a public health emergency fund uh, to to prepare us, as you rightly captured uh, the the essence of what the symposium was about. Mm. Uh, are you asking entirely for the revision? Of, of the COVID-19 levy? Is that basically what you're asking for? Well, not necessarily a revision, but um, you see, the thing is that uh, Ghana has signed up to international health regulations. And indeed, in the medium uh, term uh, policy framework 2017, the government committed to establishing uh, a public health emergency fund. If you would recall, in 2014, there was the Ebola epidemic that uh, affected a number of countries in the West Africa sub-region, particularly Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and countries like that, with huge consequences. And that was because, one, they were not prepared in terms of their public health emergencies, and two, uh, the preparedness or lack of preparedness also included lack of personnel, and very weak health infrastructure. Fortunately, here in Ghana, our health infrastructure is generally very good. Uh, over the decades, we have built up a very good health infrastructure with hospitals, teaching hospitals, research institutions, training institutions, and so on. However, following that particular commitment by government, there was actually an emergency fund that was set up precisely to be put aside so that if there were any emergencies, then uh, we will be prepared to react to it. Uh, but emergencies are not only there for us to react to, but we have to be proactive. We have to be prepared. And that is why we are calling for uh, this fund. And the levy, as you recall recently, uh, the president in his last address uh, on the ending you know, of the COVID-19 emergency, uh, stated that the 1% uh, COVID-19 levy, which actually came in handy for helping us to deal with the pandemic, was going to be retained. And so the plan is that if it is going to be retained, then it's, it, there's a need for us to ring fence it. And it could serve as seed funding, because the amount that we need for public health emergency preparedness is far more than what we'll get from the 1%. But the 1% will be good seed funding, uh, which would then be the basis upon which we look for further funding from government and from our bilateral partners 
so that we can be assured that we have this fund uh, so that we can deal with any public health emergency. Uh, Ghanaians are overburdened with, with new taxes. I'm not sure you're asking for an add-on. No, we are not. We are certainly not uh, asking for an add-on. What we are saying is that the 1% levy that the government has decided to retain uh, should be ring-fenced and then recalled, relabeled as an emergency fund. Don't forget that. When we talk of uh, emergencies, they are not only in terms of diseases that uh, arise, such as you know, the ones that we've just been dealing with, but also disasters. You know, flooding, for example, people become displaced. And during that time, cholera and other public health problems arise. And so we are saying that the 1% should actually be ring-fenced mm. and used as seed money. It will not be enough, but it will be a good start. And we can look for other sources of funding to help build and grow the fund. All right. Grateful. Uh, Prof, thanks for spending some time with us. And on Thursday, uh, members of the Pensioner Bondholders Forum uh, will resume picketing uh, the Finance Ministry uh, once again, to de demand payment of the coupon area since picketing started in February, a uh, government has cleared 30 out of 36 total coupon areas. Government has also paid all four outstanding principals since February 2023. Uh, this round of picketing has raised uh, some concerns over the motivation for members of the Pensioner Bondholders Forum returning to picket the Finance Ministry despite government's efforts over the period. Confident of the group, Dr. Edu Anani Entry has been providing some clarification. What people don't understand is that this data that has been cleared, it wasn't cleared, it wasn't paid to one person. Every one of these pensioners has his bond, uh, his coupon coming up for payment at one point in time. Mm -hmm. My brother's one has been paid. Mine is coming up today. Mm -hmm. I need my money, I haven't been paid. So, you don't say because your brothers has been paid two months ago and people should understand the bond market government bond market if government every week if government issue the bonds then every week you know there will be a coupon due mm -hmm. that coupon due will not be due to people who were paid their coupon last week everybody buys is uh, uh, independently so this six that is outstanding it is outstanding for people who are yet to receive any coupon since the DDEP started. People have st uh, received yes two months ago. That was when two years they have received yes. So p the people now have to receive their somebody. This is the first time because six months, six months. The first time he is or she is going to have his coupon. His coupon. So, so if we think that you have paid thirty, so the rest of the six delay you don't understand the market you don't understand what so happening. it's um, more or less an act that is backed by the fear that yes. the way the payment schedule has gone if i don't i also don't get involved to press home the demand it may get to my tenant government will yes pay. even people whose coupons are not due yet they must press home this so that government will stop mm -hmm. so that by the time their coupon is due it will, it will not be promptly. here to be paid properly so Wherever you look at, it is not, and when somebody says, oh, there are six, why well, about government pay you three, then later on paid? It is not to be paid to one person. Mm. For you to say, government owe me six, so if he pays me three, that's okay. The six is due to different, different people. Mm. Some ones is the first one, some ones is the second one, some one is the last one. Mm. Whom do you say that person for uh, government should pay three and leave the three? Mm. So it is not like that. It is due to different investors. Everyone, we all didn't buy our bonds the same day. Mm. Everybody bought his or her bond separately, independently. So if you, if there is even one coupon in arrears, there are pensioners who are affected by that one coupon in arrears. Mm. And if, for example, you have fought to get your brother whose one was due last month to be paid, you should also still fight for the person whose one is yet, yet to, be, to be, paid. be paid. Okay. Because if you don't do that, and you think that, oh, I have received my coupons. So I'm, there are people who have received their coupons, but we fought for you to receive your coupon. Your brother's one hasn't been paid. 
it's not even yet some of them is not yet but we believe that if we don't end this we will continuously be picketing before government peace that okay. should not be the case Reacting to how long the group can sustain this picketing, Dr. Anani says they will continue till government fulfills its own promise to pay the coupons promptly. You know, once we are here, we are not going until we are paid. They know that. So they know nothing can move us from here apart from where we see the payment has started. In fact, the last time they promised paying, and we have said, and we have told the ministry, that if it is due on Monday, you must pay on Monday. However, if you are not able to pay on Monday, we will rest. We'll give you Tuesday. If you don't pay Tuesday, we will rest. Wednesday, if you don't pay, then we know that you are not going to pay. So mm. Thursday, Friday, we are here. Mm. So there was one that were due the five coupons. They promised we were going to pay. Thursday, they had Wednesday, they haven't paid. We came here. When we went to the meeting, they said they have directed the, uh, the Bank of Ghana to pay. And Bank of Ghana has even told them that they have sent the money, funds to the banks. I said, well, we haven't received it. So that, that Thursday, we left the meeting and came to continue our picketing because we haven't received payment. It was after we have left here in the evening that the alert system started working, informing us that the payments had started. Then Friday, we didn't come. Mm. So that tells you that if it's in arrears and government pay, we won't come here. Is, Unless we come protest. here, government will not pay. I'm saying this. Government has not paid without we coming here. Mm. And the, the history is there. From the 20, when we started this, 22 coupons were due. We have to come here before government pay. When we stop coming here, government still stop, also stop. You see, as we, if we stop picketing, then government also stop paying. So that is a, that is a relationship. Sure. Stop again. We thought that after we have done this, government was going to religiously be paying to avoid these elderly people coming here. It's like a parent. You know you must buy your, your child a food. And you want your child always to cry before you buy the food. What is that? You know you must buy the, your child a food. Why do you want the, your child to always cry? Cry before you buy the food. Once you know you must buy the, your child your food. That's exactly what government is treating us. Mm. Government knows it must pay us, but it wants us to come here and make this noise before it pays. That shouldn't be the case. Let's go to Parliament now. Leadership of the minority and the majority caucuses in Parliament are uh, haggling over when to consider the controversial anti gay bill before the House. Parliament's Constitutional and Legal Affairs uh, Committee has uh, recommended the approval of the bill. We'll hear uh, from the, uh, both sides of the aisle shortly. But uh, first, listen to the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joseph Osei Wusu, announcing uh, the Speaker's directive. I have been directed by the Speaker to bring to the attention of the Business Committee uh, two matters. One, the standing orders committee's report should be programmed for Thursday. So please take note and have it programmed for Thursday. Two, the proper human sexuality and Ghanaian family values bill be programmed for Tuesday or Thursday, whatever it is. It must be on the other paper next week. And that Tuesday, the motion for second reading of that bill should be programmed for Tuesday or Thursday. These are the, the directives of Mr. Speaker. Well, Deputy uh, Minority Whip Ahmed Ibrahim says the bill must be taken on Thursday due to the Asin North by election scheduled for Tuesday. Chief Mata and a number of civil society organizations and political watchers, and as well as constitutional watchers, have interest in it, and they'll be watching this house. You've given either Tuesday or Thursday. Tuesday, we know, will be the Asin North by election. And we know a number of MPs, maybe your good self, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> may be there. And we need we need to do a very comprehensive debate 
well researched debate on it, sensing that and foreseeing that the numbers may not be able to be organized on Tuesday. Mr. Speaker, if we can be specific that the mo that motion be taken on Thursday, which we know that our brothers who will go for the Eid ladder on Wednesday will be here. And those who go for the Asino by election on Tuesday will be here. So that the House will be properly constituted to take that historical debate. But the Majority Chief Whip Frankano Dompret says it must be taken on Tuesday and uh, that the minority cannot put a seen North by election ahead of their parliamentary responsibilities. The First Deputy has said that it's a directive from the Speaker. Yes, it's a directive from the Speaker and it's given two days. A seen North is a national exercise. Parliament of Ghana is also a national exercise. So, you, if you are interested, you need to prioritize. So that we don't need to gravitate unnecessarily and be oscillating between the two. If it's Thursday, let's stick to Thursday. Anybody who is interested in this debate must show up. You cannot prioritize a sin of over Parliament and expect us that the Parliament will wait for you. So I disagree with my colleague. He should abandon his, 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 his submission with respect. Both are national exercise, so choose one. You can't have the two. But he wants to have the truth. <laughs> Therefore, we should stick to the Tuesday. And we are all excited about that. It's the first of its kind uh, in the Ghanaian media space set to uh, go uh, a notch higher by recognizing and honoring the persons behind the stories uh, we tell daily. Yes, it's the Joy News Impact Makers Award, which uh, comes off later this evening at the Labadi Beach Hotel, where we celebrate ordinary people making extraordinary impact in their communities. Tonight, uh, 11 people will be honored for their selflessness towards the advancement of their communities. So, who are the finalists? And of course, you've seen uh, some of the names come up there, but we have uh, more coming your way here on the Joy News channel. You want to make a date with us uh, later tonight. Uh, let's deal with this public health emergency because the number of uh, cattle that have died from the anthrax outbreak in the Upper East region has now reached 99, spreading from the Binduri district uh, to five other districts tonight. So there's a concern that the continuous spread of the disease could spark a national crisis as Muslims prepare to celebrate uh, Eid festivities next week. The outbreak was uh, detected at the start of this month uh, with four suspected cases and one death. Here's uh, the update we have for you as you have it on uh, the screen right now, but we're also fortunate to have, uh, of course, the head of our health desk, uh, Fred Smith, join us with the data. So we've seen some numbers, starting off with this one on the screens. Um, of course, we started with 99, as you were pointing out too. That's the total number of uh, cattle. Uh, uh, that animals, we've lost. Animals yeah. Okay, because, not just yes. Okay. Yes, because right. we we know that mm -hmm. there are some uh, pigs, goats, and sheep. Okay, so it's also, not as though it's attacking just one. one no, time. Not, not at all. So if you check the uh, vaccinations, they are targeting all of these animals mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. sure that they are safe. So the spread is in six districts, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It started from Binduri, or in the Upper East region. Right. But the others are Talensi, mm -hmm. Boga okay. Municipal, Boku West, Boku Municipal, and Bongo. All of these One, districts two, three, have some cases uh, they are dealing with. And so the vaccination mm -hmm. uh, is on. Yes. Nearly 30,000 animals have so far been vaccinated. And here's the breakdown for that. We have uh, 10,131 goats, mm -hmm. 9,706 cattle, and 9,413 sheep with 654 pigs uh, receiving vaccines. Is this a targeted vaccination process? Oh. Given what we're seeing right now, the fact that 
It's happening even within an area. Yes, indeed. So for any of these animals found within the region, mm. they want to uh, vaccinate them just in case that they have, uh, they've, they've, catch, they've caught the bacteria right. to prevent spread yeah. to humans, you know, because this can get to humans as well and mm. they'll be sick. Uh, you can actually die. It's very fatal from that. Mm. And so uh, the, the districts, uh, and you can guess, yeah. Binduri has received the biggest of the vaccines, 11,716 so far. Uh, Talency with 9,615, 2,948 in Boku East, and Bongo with 2,945 uh, vaccinations. Then Boga Municipal has 2,468, and then Boku Municipal has 200. Mm -hmm. And 12 okay. of these animals. Giving, giving the festivities that we're looking at uh, in the coming days, how is the say, Ghana Health Service together with the veterinary service working? How are they working together to ensure that there's public education on how the public can be safe in these times? Well, public education has been ongoing. Uh, radio and radio stations in the region have all been given information that they are spreading. But also, health officials are on the ground interacting with farmers and people who own uh, these animals directly. Mm. So the veterinary services are there, the Ghana Health Service also, and then the, the Security Council, the Regional Security Council, is also uh, part of this whole sensitization program to be sure that as we edge closer, a lot of people will be buying some of these animals uh, for to celebrate eat next week and they don't want a situation where people will eat uh, any animal which has been infected yes we've been advised that if you cook and cook this well you are you are likely to be able to eat without catching the infection but of course you want to uh, take extra precaution by not eating any animal that is already infected our first meet is the head of our health desk here at join you well, that's all we have for you in this package of the polls. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. I'm blessed as we can. Let's uh, connect later on. But uh, for now, that's all we have for you here on the Joy News uh, channel. Thanks for watching. Next is Let's Talk Showbiz.